will must find on you. You must find on uh, Good, 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 good. Oh, finally. <laughs> Thank you so much. You guys who joined from me, go back to Vadaye Murungu. Go back to Vadaye Murungu. Those who have joined via Liz Gucci, please. I'm ending this live on this at the end. Please go back to TMM. Go back to TMM. God bless you. Uh, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. It's like it's like some technology demons are scared of this broadcast. Today. <laughs> finally, finally we are here. Well, we're here, and to God be the glory. Thank you Amen. for having me here. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. you're, welcome. you're welcome. Thank you. And we are so humbled having you here. I'm honored to be here. How have you been? Great. I just came from preaching, and uh, mm -hmm. it's been wonderful. God is just good. The word of God is growing, and men are coming to the knowledge of the truth. And I'm excited Amen. to see what God is doing with you and TMM and everybody that is connected on the platform tonight. You know, it's just going to be a wonderful time. I'm excited. Amen, 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 amen. You are a gift to us. And we really appreciate the Lord for you. Amen. And having you here, it's, uh, it's a big honor. And I bless the Lord for you. Amen. Now, we to actually take a lot of time we'd like to actually welcome you to say hi to the members and everyone on board and you're going we are going to take off thank you for, for having me pastor lees and everybody that is on the platform tonight what a joy to have all of you connected guys listen we're going to have an exciting time we're going to have a time of revelation knowledge god's word is going to come with clarity all your great areas in scripture or from the things I teach, I'm excited to bring clarity and to help you understand the truth of the gospel. This whole thing is about Christ, 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 what Christ has done for all of us, what he is doing today, and what he will yet do. So get ready, guys. We're going to have a great time as we fellowship. Help us share the videos. Tag as many people as possible. Drop them in as many groups as possible everywhere. Connect everybody including those whom you know don't like what I teach, bring them on. Let them ask their questions. I actually like those people who don't like me because they are all partners with me. They always help us spread the news somehow. So invite them, tag them, bring them on. Let's have a good time of learning and growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pastor Lee's, over to you. Yes. Thank you again for having me here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Papa. Uh, we are humbled. We are really humbled. And so today we are having many questions than last time. And I would like to start from uh, where we ended last time. I went through the live. I went through the, the, the previous live and I came up with a few questions that people are left with a concern and they would like you to clarify about it. And because we have actually consumed a bit of time with those technicalities, I would like to actually go straight to the questions. Sure. Yes, and uh, we actually tackled about Holy Communion, and uh, there is that part, do this in the remembrance of me. Actually, one of the members, or rather one of the followers, uh, criticized you, and actually out of that, she said that you are preaching error, and because she could not understand what did Jesus mean by do this in the remembrance of me? All right. Well, you see, the thing is, um, some of the people who just uh, want to learn, but they don't want to pay the price of patience and the price of sitting down to truly learn, they're hypocrites. If somebody truly wants to learn something and wants to understand something, the person must be able to sit down and patiently. For example, my teaching on the Holy Communion, 
It's in a book of yes. about 400 pages. 400 pages. There's no way you will read those 400 pages with a heart that is ready to learn and not understand the concept. The first thing is, there is nothing like Holy Communion in the Bible. Anybody who wants to contest that with me should bring a scripture that talks about Holy Communion. There's none in the whole Bible. There's none. So, what looks like Holy Communion? What looks like Holy Communion in the Bible is the Passover feast. And the Passover feast was a feast of Jewish people, which Moses mm -hmm. gave to them in Exodus chapter 12, so that they would do that feast every year, once a year. It was done once a year, so that through that feast, Moses can keep communicating to them the promise of Christ, that Christ was coming, Christ was going to come, he will die for us, his body will be broken, and his blood will be shed. But it was a feast. And in the feast, it was four cups, four, not one cup. It was four cups. Then the bread must be unleavened bread. Then there will be herbs. And it is a complete feast. But what you have in your churches today is not a feast. Number two, it is not even a proper Passover because it's just one cup. And it is not even four cups. And even the bread is not unleavened bread. So if you want to do the feast, do it well. And if you don't want to do it, stop doing mockery. It has to either be a feast or not a feast. Then number two, Passover is not breaking of bread. Breaking mm -hmm. of bread is law feast. Number three, Passover is not the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is evening food. So Passover was just a feast. And when Jesus joined the feast in the book of Luke, he said to them, I will no more eat this feast with you until that day in my father's kingdom, which means that that feast had ended. Jesus put an end to that feast of the Passover. And he said to them, the next time we will eat this will be in, on that day in my father's kingdom. In 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. chapter 5, verse 7, Brother Paul writing to the church in Corinth said, that Jesus is our Passover, which means the Passover is no longer a feast. The Passover now is a person. His name is Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible says we are the bread. We, we are the bread. So the bread mm -hmm. is no more bread from bakery. The bread is we. Now where they have a problem is do this in remembrance of me. Again, yes. if that in remembrance of me is a memorial service, a memorial service where you remember the dead, do you remember the dead or the living? Memorials are not done for the dead. I mean for the living. They are done for the dead. Is Jesus dead or alive? He's alive. He's alive. If he's alive, then we don't need to remember him because he lives in our hearts. So the memorial doesn't come in anymore. You only do a memorial for the dead. Jesus is not dead, he's alive. So why are you trying to remember a living man who lives inside your heart? So once they understand that, they are free from that, do this in remembrance of me. Because it's not a memorial service. Because Jesus is not dead, Jesus is alive. But once again, whoever wants more clarity can get my book, The Communion Table, which begins from Exodus, into the New Testament with clear exigencies. I hope that can help a little bit. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, water baptism. Water again, baptism. Again, again. Water yes. baptism. Water baptism was given to John the Baptist so that he can point to Jesus. If mm -hmm. you read John chapter 1 from verse 29, to 31. Pastor Liz, if you have a Bible there, help me read. John chapter 1, from verse 29 to verse 31, so that we can read it from the Bible. Let me give explanation. John chapter 1, verse 29 to verse 31. Okay, John. John what? Chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, the next day, John saw Jesus coming down, coming toward him, and said, "Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." 
Next verse. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Yes. I myself did not know him, but yes. the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. So did you get that? The reason why John the Baptist used water to baptize was to reveal Jesus. So since John didn't know who Jesus was, they were cousins, but he didn't know that the, his cousin was Jesus. So God now told him to start baptizing everybody in Israel, that in the midst of baptism, the one that will kneel down and the heavens will open and a dove will come on him, that will be Jesus. So what a baptism was given to John to identify Jesus. Please read on the next verse, Pastor Lise. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So, so John said, I will use water to identify him. But once I identify him with water, he will not use water. He will use the Holy Spirit. So John put a disclaimer on water baptism by himself. Now today, is it John that is baptizing you or Jesus? If it is John, he will use water. If it is Jesus, he will use the Holy Spirit. Whoever is arguing on water baptism can choose to be baptized by John. That's not a problem to me. But if it is Jesus that will baptize you, Jesus does not use water. Jesus uses the Holy Spirit. That means the moment you are born again, you are baptized into Jesus. Pastor Liz, read, read for me Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. For more clarity, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 4 and 5. There's yes. one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. How many baptisms? One. So if you are baptized with water, you have gotten two baptisms, you have disobeyed the Bible. Because salvation is baptism of the spirit. Then water is another baptism. But you're supposed to have just one baptism, not two baptisms. I hope that is clear. Thank you. Uh, does it mean, okay, do we have water baptism in the Church of Acts of Apostles? The Church of Acts, first of all, the book of Acts is a book of, is a book of eyewitness. What Dr. Luke saw as the church progressed from the law to the grace of God, from the law okay. to the grace. So in their transitioning, you will see what we call a cross-testamental application. For example, you will see a practice of the law of Moses in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 15, where James says, people should not eat meat sacrificed to idols. People should abstain from eating pig. People should abstain from fornication before they are saved. That is the law of Moses in Acts chapter 15. Then you will see Ananias and Sapphira killed by Peter, which is the law of sin and death in the book of Acts. So there are cross-testamental applications. So that's why you see water baptism practice. But from chapter 11 of Acts, you will not see it again because the teaching of Brother Paul had entered the church and they have understood that water baptism is not relevant when you receive Jesus Christ. So it ended, just like every other thing carried over, ended in the book of Acts. Wow. Now, what is sin and does a believer sin? Sin, well, that's a very big subject because we need a lot of explanation to arrive at sin. But simply sin is to disobey the word of God. So do believers sin? Yes. Believers sin because it's not all the time that believers do the word of God. So what, what happens to the sin of the believer? First John chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. Brother John says, my little children, these mm -hmm. things write I unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous so the sin of the believer 
is taken care of by the advocacy of Jesus. What Jesus has done takes care of the believer's sin, past, present, and future. So in Jesus, we have the automatic forgiveness of sins. Now, First John 3, 6. First John 3, 6 says, No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. So you have to read the whole book to understand what John was talking about. He was talking about the nature of the believer, the DNA. That once you receive Jesus, you have the DNA of God in you. So sin will no more be a desire. You will no more be comfortable with sin because that's no more your environment. That's not your comfort place. So that's what John is talking about, that you have the nature of God, you have the seed of God. Therefore, you cannot sin. That is, sin is no more your nature. So when believers sin, they are acting contrary to their nature. That's why they cannot be comfortable in it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, once said, forever said, a statement that has actually caused a lot of uproar on social media and between pastors. Who preaches I try not the gospel? Yeah. Pastor Liz, I try not to bother myself with one saved, always saved, because the people that are arguing are already saved, whether they know it or not. So <laughs> arguing with them is a waste of energy. They are already saved, and they are saved eternally. Whether they know it or not, whether they accept it or not, they are already saved anyway. So arguing with them is a waste of time. However, we must all realize that salvation is eternal. It is called eternal life. It is called it everlasting life. It is called eternal salvation. It is called the life of God. Nicodemus said to Jesus, can I go back to my mother's womb and be born again? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, what is wrong with you? Once you are born, you are born. That which is born of flesh is flesh. Once you receive Christ, you are saved. You don't lose salvation salvation because salvation is not your work it is the work of christ pastor Liz, do you have an amplified bible let me check let me if check. you have an amplified i'd like you to read in black and white white for us uh, john chapter 10 verse 28 and 29 john chapter 10 verse 28 and 29 and i like it in the amplified because of the the way it is explained. John chapter 10? Yes, yes verse 28 and 29. Mm -hmm. uh, amplified. Uh -huh. And I give them eternal life. Yes. Uh, hold on a bit. Hold on a bit. I'm sorry. And I give them eternal life. Yes. And they shall never lose it or perish. Hold on. Read it again. Day. Read it again. Let them hear it. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never lose it. Stop. Or read it again. Pastor, please read it again. They need to hear it very loud. <laughs> And I give them eternal life, and they shall never lose it or perish throughout the ages. Into bracket. To all eternity, they shall never by any means be destroyed. And no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. Uh, hey, I've lost verse 29. I've lost verse 29 just a bit. Uh, you can actually be handling that before I do the 29. Okay. I, realized I didn't have that, but I'll download it shortly as you explain. Okay, so you never lose it. It's in black and white. They shall never lose it. And all these people having a problem with losing salvation, they can go and remove that from the Bible. <laughs> Jesus said they shall never lose it. You and Jesus who gave the salvation. Is it not Jesus 
Why are you arguing with what Jesus has given to us? You shall never lose it. In fact, Hebrews 7.25, he calls it, he ever liveth to make intercession. He ever liveth. That's the work of Christ. So believers don't lose salvation because nobody earned it. It was given as a gift of God's grace. And the Savior secures the saved. In the book of Romans, Brother Paul, in Romans chapter 8, he says, no one shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. Not hunger, not, not peril, not sword, not nakedness, not things to come, not things present, not principalities, no powers, no height, no depth, no wheat, no length, no breadth shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You don't lose salvation. The Bible is very clear in black and white. Anybody having problem Praise with losing salvation is suffering from identity crisis. And uh, they cannot blame us for their ignorance of understanding the scripture. We don't take responsibility for their lack of understanding. We try to teach as much as we can. But if they decide to stay in darkness, we can do nothing about it. Good. I'm still waiting for mine uh, to download. And before that, uh, what is turning away from the Lord? Is that the same way as sin? There's nothing like turning away from the Lord. Once you have received the Lord, you don't turn away from the Lord. You see, the problem is people do not understand the import of salvation. Salvation is not you receiving the Lord. Mm. Salvation is you accepting what the Lord has done and by that acceptance, you and the Lord are like a scrambled egg situation. You are mixed into each other. He can't lose you, you can't lose him. That's why it's called eternal life. That's why Brother Paul will say in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. It is Christ that lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you also read the book of 1 John, John says, when Christ who is our life, he is our life. We can't lose him. Mm -hmm. He is our life. It's called eternal life. It's called everlasting life. Life without end. How can you lose what you didn't obtain? Salvation is the gift of God's grace and is the one that secures it forever. Praise the Lord. Now I can... Uh... Now I can read both. I can read both uh, both verses. Yep. I have it here now. Yep. And uh, I'm sorry, sorry for taking time. Yeah. Oh. Uh huh. Twenty-eight and twenty-nine. John yep. twenty-eight and twenty-nine. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never lose it. Or say it perish. again, say it again, say it again, Pastor. Please read that line like three times because some people need to really hear it. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never lose it or perish throughout the ages. That's right. To all, to all eternity, they shall never by any means be destroyed. That's right. And no one is able to snatch them out of my hand yes 29 yeah. my father who has given them to me is greater and mightier than all yes. else and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand that's right it's, it's clear so anybody having problem with eternal salvation should go and check those scriptures i've given check it john 10 28 29 hebrews 7 25 26 romans chapter 8 from verse 31 to 39 those are scriptures and if they have any scripture that shows that you can lose salvation they should bring it we'll explain it to them i'm here anywhere in the bible they should bring it i'm here we'll explain it to them Yeah, thank you. Let me highlight a little uh, with the, with our admins. With our admins, please don't allow anyone, distract anyone 
if anyone is not for this and did not come to learn, uh, let him not, not uh, distract the rest. Kindly, if you see a comment that is destructive, kindly block that uh, person and we proceed. Block that person and as we proceed. That's right. Uh, Papa, That's right. What, is, what is seeing the kingdom of God? What is seeing the kingdom of God? And secondly, what is entering into the kingdom of God? And what is inheriting the kingdom of God? They are all the same. All of them are the same. It's just language. Because the first two, Jesus used it on Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5. Except a man be born of water, which is the spirit, which water symbolic of the spirit, he cannot enter. To see means to enter. To enter means to see. To inherit means to enter. It means to receive. It means to have. So it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. All right. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is Jesus. The kingdom of God is Jesus and what he has done. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That is the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is a Greek word, basilia. Basilia means the reign of God, the reign of God, the rulership of God in the heart of a man. So the moment you receive Jesus, you have received the kingdom of God in your heart, the rule of God, the reign of God, the regime of God, the rulership of God, the word Basilio in the Greek. Wow, 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 wow. Now, uh, what is ordination for the fourfold ministries and is it biblical yes. yes ordination is biblical it's just public acknowledgement or public acceptance public acknowledgement or public acceptance of a minister who is indeed laboring in ministry so the church comes together or his spiritual parents come together to say we have today acknowledged that you have made a full proof of your ministry and we set you apart into higher responsibility and honor in the service of Jesus. That's what happened to Paul in Acts chapter 13. The Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas. That was ordination. That's what ordination is. All right. What are the priestly apparels or the attires that are worn by our fivefold ministers? And are they also the New Testament? Uh, okay, are, are they acceptable in the New Testament? Uh, what is the importance if of, they are? Of men of God wearing choir uniforms? No, the men of God with the collar and all, all the, the garments that they wear when they have been ordained. Yeah, that's why I call it choir uniforms. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a mode of dressing. <laughs> <laughs> it's choir robes now. It's choir robes with the cossack or cassock. All those things don't mean anything. Anybody can buy them and wear. That's not the proof of the call of God. You don't need a uniform to be called. But there's nothing wrong with wearing a uniform if you belong to a group of ministers that believe they should wear a uniform to identify themselves. Okay, just like i wear suit i like suits because i just feel suits give me the kind of composure i need to teach i can also wear natives and if i like i can wear the choir uniforms i've worn it before i wore it one time i went to preach in a meeting where everybody is wearing choir uniform and they gave me one i wore it with the chain you needed to see me i was sweating because i was not comfortable in those things to preach so it's nothing it doesn't mean you are called of god for wearing those things anybody can buy it in the market and wear it it doesn't mean anything the real thing is what god has put in you that will bless the world that's what matters amen yeah mm -hmm. what is this uh uh, with the anointing of houses, anointing of cars, anointing of the things, the physical, the material things that we usually buy, anointing the plots or rather the mashambas or gardens that we do buy, uh, is very important. Why will you be anointing things? Why are you 
anointing cars and anointing houses and anointing trees. Why are you anointing brooms? Then you can as well go and anoint our streets, anoint our cars, anoint everywhere. The, once you have a car, you yourself in that car is a blessing of the car. That you're using the car, the car is already blessed. You don't need a special anointing for car. It is the blessing on you that enables you to buy the car. So you're already blessed. You don't need to bless it. But if you want your pastor to pray and thank God that you got a car, there's nothing wrong with it. But you don't need it. You don't need somebody to come and bless your house. It is because you are blessed that you built the house. You know, I'm a pastor. And uh, I will not attack what I know is right as a pastor. Some of my members are on this platform watching. I used to do it before because I didn't know what I was doing. But when I studied the Bible carefully and I saw that all those things were just traditions, they have no spiritual relevance. I decided not to waste my time and waste people's time, giving them, um, giving them false hope in things that are not scriptural. Okay, child, uh, children dedication. Same thing with children dedication. You don't need to bring your children for me to dedicate. As a parent, you have the right to dedicate your children and bless them. But if you want me as their pastor to pray over your child, I will pray after all, they brought children for Jesus and Jesus blessed them. So yes, if you want your pastor to bless your children, there's nothing wrong with it. It's like a father speaking a blessing over the children. Thank you. Yep. So why do we pray if God is an all-knowing God and he knows what we really need even before we ask? Why should we pray if he knows everything? Your prayer is you yourself getting involved with what God has already provided. Prayer doesn't get God to do something. Prayer is you. In fact, let me put it like this first of all. Prayer does, is not getting God's attention. Prayer is not informing God of your problem. Prayer is, is not getting God to know about your needs. Prayer is a medium of fellowship with God. And in the midst of fellowship, you receive and take delivery of what he has already provided. So we pray to receive what is already ours, provided by God. And prayer is our opportunity to exercise our authority on the earth. Prayer is our opportunity to exercise our authority on the earth. I hope that's clear. Thank you. Someone is asking why Hannah had to dedicate someone. Just like children brought children, just like parents brought children to Jesus and Jesus blessed them. Simply that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, who is an intercessor? What is intercession? And should we have the intercessors department in our churches? No, we don't have intercessors. Why will you have intercessors department in churches? You don't need to have any intercessor. First of all, no human being is an intercessor. Intercession <laughs> is the office of Jesus. Only Jesus is the intercessor. What we do is we, we supplicate. We supplicate. We don't intercede. Jesus is the intercessor and he ever lived to intercede for us. So what we do is we supplicate. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, praying with all prayers and supplication. So we supplicate. And in supplication, we agree with the word of God and take position with God's word. That is supplication. Then secondly, in our churches, we are not supposed to have a special department of prayer. Everybody is supposed to pray. So it is the job of a pastor to mobilize the whole church, to understand that all of us have a collective responsibility to pray for the work of God, to pray for the ministry, to pray for evangelism, to pray for souls, that is one of our ways of serving. So we pray, number one, to fellowship with God, and number two, we pray as a ministry. Our prayer becomes a ministry for the saints, for the sinners that are yet to be saved, and for the advancement of the kingdom of God. So there's no special prayer department. Everybody is praying in that prayer department. Mm-hmm. What is praying in the spirit? Praying in the spirit is praying in tongues. Because, 
because uh, first corinthians chapter 14 says he that speaketh in tongues speaketh not unto men but unto god how be it in the spirit so when you are speaking in tongues you're in the spirit that means prayer in tongues is prayer in the spirit all right should we pray the lord's prayer are you the lord <laughs> you, are not, you are not the Lord. Why will you pray the Lord's prayer? Let the Lord pray his prayer. <laughs> you are not the Lord. Let the Lord pray his prayer. Now, I said that on a lighter note. What we call the Lord's prayer was actually not a prayer. It was Jesus was teaching the disciples the character of God. The character of God in a prayer outline. It wasn't a complete prayer. It was an outline. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, thy power and thy glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, in translation... There was the personal pronoun missing in that translation because as at the time it was translated, there was no personal pronouns. All right? So actually the way it's supposed to read that our lost prayer, the way it's supposed to read is, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You give us this day our daily bread. You deliver us from the evil one. You lead us not into temptation. You deliver us from evil. You forgive us our debts so that we can forgive our debtors. See, we are learning from him. He is not learning from us. He is not the one that leads to temptation, but he is the one that delivers us from temptation. He does not lead us into evil. Okay? Because the Bible says God cannot tempt, be tempted with evil, neither tempted he anyone. So what we call the Lord's Prayer is actually Jesus teaching the disciples the character of God. That God doesn't lead into temptation. God delivers from evil. It is God that supplies the daily bread. And daily bread there is no food. Daily bread in that context is salvation. The bread of salvation. The bread of the finished work of Christ. So again, it's not a prayer. It is a teaching on the character of God that we learn from. Now, now, being on that, what happened to Job? Did God allow Job to be tested with evil? No, it was not God. Job chapter 3 verse 25. Job said, that thing which I feared has come upon me. So it was Job's fear that opened the door for Satan to deal with Job. It was Job's fear. It was not God. The only thing the Bible teaches on Job is his patience. How he was patient. That's all. Job himself placed a disclaimer on his book. In Job chapter 42 from verse 5 and 6. He said, at the hearing of you by the hearing of the ears. What it means is, all I know about God in 41 chapters is rumor. What people told me. I didn't know God directly, but now I see God directly. So that means Job placed a disclaimer on the things he said in the 41 chapters. So you don't take the things Job said serious because he himself later on said, don't take me serious. What I said was based on rumor. So God didn't tempt Job. Job's fear opened the door for Satan to attack Job. The only part God played was in his mercy. He brought Job out of the predicament. Thank you. How do you pray unceasingly? You pray unceasingly by having the spirit of God in you. So because mm -hmm. you have the spirit of God in you, you just be in an attitude, atmosphere of prayer. You pray when you have every, any little moment. You pray when you have your break at work. You pray on your way to work. You pray in between your job. You pray after work. You pray while you sleep. You just pray. 
Pray without ceasing means pray all the time. But the only way you can pray all the time is by the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, someone was asking uh, concerning prayer, and she asked about Jesus saying that whatever you pray in my name, you shall get, and you shall receive. What is the whatever? So she was asking about what is that whatever? Whatever is whatever. No, whatever is not whatever. Whatever in the context of that discourse, not general. There's a discourse where Jesus brought that whatever you shall ask the Father. So mm -hmm. the way to solve the problem is to read the pretext and read the post-text. When you read the pretext and the post-text, you will know what he meant by whatever. Mm -hmm. For example, in the book of Luke, when he said, he that acts it, receive it. He that seek it, find it. He that knock it, the door shall be open. Then Jesus now said, which of you? He said, if you that are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. Okay? How, how much more? He now explains what he means by he that acts it, receive it. It's not open. He said, how much more shall the Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? So he that accept receive it holy spirit he that seeketh holy spirit find it he that knocketh for the holy spirit the door shall be open the context there is holy spirit is not ambiguous so the whatever is not ambiguous it's within a context and we have to read the pretext and the post text to understand the context does god listen to the non-believers and does he answer the non-believers oh, yes god answers every prayer every prayer whether you're a believer most of the people that pray to jesus in the four gospels were they believers they were not believers yet jesus answered them he answered them he healed them he granted their requests but they were not believers jesus is god almighty whatever jesus does is what god does if jesus answered the prayers of everybody in the four gospels who prayed to him it means god answers everybody's prayer mm -hmm. so why do good things happen to non-believers and bad things happen to the believers? Well, that question requires a lot of exegesis and a lot of teaching. But I will try to answer within a short, you know, what we're doing here is we're just giving people teasers, teasers, teasers. These are not exhaustive teachings. And Bible subjects must be exhaustively taught. So I'll try and just give a little bit of teasers. But most of these questions, some of them, you can find full teachings for them on my YouTube channel on YouTube. They are there for free. You can go there, Google any subject, and just listen to the full teaching. Now, why do, why do evil things happen to unbelievers, and why do bad things happen to believers? Evil things happen to unbelievers because unbelievers have made the choice to live without Jesus. They have made the choice to accept Satan as their master. And anywhere Satan is, evil must happen because he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's why evil happens to unbelievers. The choices they make, the person they have submitted themselves to, which is Satan, and of course, because we live in an imperfect world where evil things happen sometimes. Why do evil happen to believers? Three things. Number one, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge. Number two, because sometimes believer make, believers make wrong choices. Choices that allow Satan to come in and attack. And then finally, evil happens to believers because we are human beings. And in this world, it's an imperfect world where sometimes things just happen that you have no control over. Mm -hmm. Someone is asking that I say that I should not pray for favor, for more favor, more mercy, more love. Double, double. Why will you pray for all of that when God has already given you everything? Look at the planet. Look at agriculture. The fields are there. Look at solid, solid, solid minerals. Gold, diamonds, they're there. Look at oil wells. They are there. Look at technology. They are there. All the technological things are there for you to make money. God has already given you everything you need on earth. So go and develop a skill. Go and invest in business. Instead of sitting down in the church and be praying, oh God bless me, oh God bless me, bless my works. Bless go and get a job. Use that energy. Go and develop a skill. Get a job. You will make money. 
and you use the money to serve God. Then you can use your energy for prayer to do other things that will benefit the kingdom of God. Now, the Bible says that uh, God predestined uh, our adoption in Christ Jesus and yep. the Son. Yep. Way before the foundation of the earth. Yep. Why did we have have to actually take all that redemption story if God had already seen us in his son, Jesus. Well, again, you know, you know that the doctrine of predestination is a function, the doctrine of election is a function of predestination. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 says, for those God foreknew, he predestinated. Those he predestinated, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Then Paul now says, What then shall we say to these things? For knowledge, predestination, election, justification, glorification. These are a proof that God is for us. That is where you see the plan of God in his foreknowledge, which led to his predestination, which now led to his election which made him justify you and glorify you. It is a proof that God is for you. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can lay charge to the, who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, it is Christ that is risen from the dead and now make it intercession for us. So, even though there is predestination, the predestination nation of God is as a result of his foreknowledge. It's just that God knows, but he didn't make the choices. So why do we have to go through things? Because God is not a tyrant. He's a loving father. So even though he has a plan for us, he still allows us to make the choice to walk in his plan or to reject his plan. Because he's not a tyrant. He's a loving father. And it is because of the choice factor, the free will of man that things have gone to the way they have gone. And that is why God in his mercy still allows time so that man can come to a place of acknowledging his need for God and submit to the knowledge of God. I hope that helps. Amen, amen. Now, I have two types of people here. I have one who have observed the Ten Commandments and for I have another one who came to the cross and received or believed in Jesus. But that person who believed in Jesus has broken one of the Ten Commandments. But this one who received Jesus is referred to as the righteousness of God. The other one who observed all the commandments is referred to as a sinner. Kindly explain. Well, a man that has broken all the commandments of God is called a sinner under the law of Moses. But Christ has redeemed us from the law. Pastor Liz, read for me Romans chapter 10, verse 4. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. While you are reading Romans chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible mm -hmm. also clearly tells us, for by, for by the law shall no man be justified. So nobody can be saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. Salvation is only in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us. For by grace are you saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So that it will not look like I'm reading from Nigerian Bible. Pastor Liz, that's why I'm always asking you to read. So read for me Romans chapter 10 verse 4 so everybody can hear it. Romans 10 verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law, the limit at which it ceases to be. For the law leads up to him who is the fulfillment of its types. And in him the purpose which it was designed to accomplish is fulfilled. That is, the purpose of the law is fulfilled in him. As the means of righteousness, right relationship to God 
for everyone who trusts in and adheres to and relies on him. That's amplified. So let me read the King James for you. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So once you believe in Jesus, you don't keep the Ten Commandments. I mean, you don't keep the laws of Moses anymore. Faith in Christ guarantees you salvation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Is the Garden of Eden a reality? Is it real? Well, if the Garden of Eden was real, it would still be existing somewhere. <laughs> so the Garden of Eden, the word Eden means presence. So the Garden of Eden simply means the presence of God, an environment that was referred to as an area of the presence where man was so supposed to stay and make the choice to either accept God's offer or reject God's offer. So Eden is a spiritual reality. So uh, I do have uh, an ability to make choices to be a sinner and to become the righteousness of God. Oh, yeah. As a man. Yeah, the choice is yours. You have the freedom to choose to be a sinner and the freedom to accept the offer of God. God forces nobody. He forces nobody. But however, when you make the choice, you make the choice, but you don't determine the outcome of your choice. You have the freedom to choose, but you will not determine the outcome of that choice. So you can make the choice. If you reject God, well, then God will leave you, and the absence of God will be destruction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What happens to those that are born and did not have the availability of the word of God, which is the power of God and salvation? Pastor Lisa, I can't hear you. Are you okay? Yes. I'm asking. I can hear you, but very faintly. Oh, okay. I'm asking, what happens to those that cannot access the word of God, which is the power of God unto salvation? There's nobody that cannot access it. That question is called assumption in theology. We don't assume. We stay with Bible narratives. The gospel is made available to everybody. Whether it is preached today or yesterday, whether it is preached as, as, you know, as a finished work or as a promise, but God makes sure that the gospel reaches everybody. Mm -hmm. What about those that uh, the, the children that are born and they don't have that chance? For, for them to experience the availability of the word of God. And they die or they are still alive? They die. Children, all children, whether they are from Christians or Muslims or pagans or anywhere, all children, when they die, they go back to Jesus. There is compassion with justice. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. He didn't say, suffer the Christian little children. He said, all little children. Suffer them to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. I have a full teaching on it with scriptures to explain. Children go back to Jesus. Children belong to Jesus. All children. Because they have not yet reached a level where they can make a choice. And there's compassion with justice. What is the word of God and what is the Bible? The Bible is the written document that contains the message of, of God and contains the revelation of God. What is the word of God? Well, in, in, in technical terms, the Bible is not the word of God, but the Bible contains the word of God because the word of God is not paper and ink. John 1.1 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, not by it. All things were made by him 
and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehends it not verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us so the word of god is a person but the bible contains the revelation that connects you to the person of the word of god amen amen god visiting the transgressions of the parents to the children or to whatever generation that's in the book of exodus exodus chapter 20 where moses said that god will visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who 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 do not fear him well that, that word visit there is a hebrew word pakwad pakwad p-a-q-a-d pakwad it means to take care of to take care of so what it means is that god will take care of the iniquities of the fathers so that it does not affect the children to the third and fourth generation god will take care of it doesn't mean visit there is not english visit it's bible language it means god will take care of those iniquities so that it doesn't affect the children and pastor leads if you observe carefully the children of those people that came out of egypt they didn't suffer the generational causes of their fathers because god took care of it now let's see the application by way of exegesis where that same word is applied in genesis chapter 22 and the lord did unto sarah as he has said and the lord visited sarah as he has spoken so when god visited sarah what was the outcome and sarah said god has made me to laugh and all those who here will laugh with me so when god visits the visitation of god makes people laugh the visitation of God does not bring the iniquities of fathers to children. And then Ezekiel also took time to explain further. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 1, 2, and 3, he said, What meanest thee that thou usest this proverb in Israel, that the fathers ate sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As truly as I live, saith God, the soul that sinned, it shall die. The sins of the fathers shall not be required from the children. And the sin of the children shall not be required from the fathers. So that is done away with. There's nothing like generational causes. Once a man is born of God, is a new creature, a new breed, a new race. He has no past. All things are passed away. He's a brand new being that never existed before. E.W. Kenyon calls it a new kind of humanity. Amen. Amen. Now, someone is asking, and I can see that question has got a lot of people following, uh, is asking whether you explain the difference between the OT, Old Testament, and the New T, and whether they should do away with the OT completely, and what is the essence? If there is a new covenant, what is the essence of the OT? Well, well we have to understand what the new covenant is. The new co mm -hmm. covenant in your Bible is Genesis I mean, the old covenant in your Bible is Genesis to Malachi. And the new covenant is Matthew to Revelation. But that's not correct. That's not correct. The new covenant is not books. And the old covenant is not books. The new covenant is a relationship with God that is predicated on what Christ has done. The old covenant is a relationship with God that is predicated on what man can do. So the old covenant is thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. The new covenant is I will, I will, I will. God is saying I will do it for you. Old covenant, you do it for yourself. Which means therefore there is old covenant in the new covenant. And there is new covenant in the old covenant. So it's not books. So you don't do away with your Genesis to Malachi because that's actually the scriptures. That's a canon. It is from Genesis to Malachi that the New Testament was brought out in a rightly divided form. So you need both the old and the new. The Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. The Old Testament is types and shadows 
prophecies and promises the new testament is the reality of the shadows you need both because it is in the reading of the old testament that you will confirm an understanding of what the new testament is teaching so you need both the old and the new so you can be very sound in your teaching look at jesus when jesus showed up in luke chapter 24 verse 25 on the way to Emmaus, he called those thieves i mean those disciples of his oh fools slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken ought not christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory look at jesus and beginning at moses so when jesus came he used Moses' teaching notes to teach when the apostles taught brother paul in, in acts 28 23 beginning at moses all of them use moses to teach we too are supposed to use moses to teach so a sound bible teacher must be able to teach christ from the old and new testament effectively and the whole book is complete when you teach it from the old and the new testament thank you thank you and i hope they have learned why did god uh, opt to choose to use shadows shadows uh, because of the people in the book of matthew 19 verse 3 to 8 they said to jesus the pharisees why did moses command to give a writing of divorcement and to put your wife away jesus said to them have you not read anaginosko that is are you reading without paying attention are you reading like newspaper have you not paid attention to what you are reading that in genesis you have gone to deuteronomy come back to genesis in bible reading you read genesis before you read deuteronomy he that created them in the beginning created them male and female and said what god has joined together let no man put asunder then they now said to jesus why then did moses command that a divorce certificate should be given to the woman then jesus said moses because of the hardness of your heart suffered you to put away your wives but from the beginning it was not so that means there are many things that man was allowed to do which was not so in the plan of god because of the state of man's heart so why did they use shadows and types shadows and types to, were used to communicate because of the state of the people the people didn't have the ability to understand clear communications like you because you are born of the spirit they were not born of the spirit oh thank you now uh why <laughs> why why did god uh introduce why didn't he did he know that there was going to be a fall of man and why didn't he introduce jesus ahead of the fall of man or rather the new testament ahead of the ot well because god sees the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end so in his foreknowledge he already saw that man will get into a predicament where man will need help so he provided no. solution before the problem he does not react he proacts all right uh now you i i hope they have understood why we have the two covenants is it okay to remarry is it okay to remarry is it okay to divorce it depends on the circumstances that question does it have a yes it does it have a yes or no answer it depends on the circumstances is it okay to remarry well if there was domestic violence if there was abuse and you parted ways and by law you have dissolved the marriage both of you are free to go and remarry what about divorce yes divorce can be allowed under persecution if a husband is persecuting his wife or the wife is persecuting the husband and life is being threatened instead of staying in that marriage and dying you are free to walk out of that marriage you are free to walk out of it even the gospel that we preach jesus said if there's persecution escape for your life so if you can escape for for persecution in 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 the gospel how much less marriage somebody is beating you every day you're almost losing your eye you're almost losing your life and you're still sitting down in the name of marriage you're no more in marriage you are in bondage you better get out of bondage god wants you to be free so yes there are circumstances where divorce is allowed and there are also circumstances 
circumstances where remarriage is allowed, depending on what the situations were when we look at it in the light of the scriptures. Um, most of the divorces and uh, most of the separated and divorces are waiting for, for their exes to die so that they can come into the freedom of marriage. Because they believe that you should not remarry until your, your ex is dead. Is a lack of proper Bible teaching. So if there's anybody here that is divorced that is waiting for his ex to die, get my book on relationships, marriage, and family life. And then you read through it, you see all the scriptures properly explained and all the exegesis done so that you can have the basis to free yourself and quickly go and get married before you get to a level where nobody will look up to you as somebody that is ready to be married. And so nobody would talk to you about marriage. I hope those who are fasting for their exes have heard that. They are fasting for them to die so that they can get married very quickly. So what is referred as sexual immorality in the context of Matthew 5, 27, 28? What is what? Referred as sexual immorality in the text of when you look Lastly, you have sexual predicted. immorality in the context of what? Matthew 5, 27 to 28. When you look lastly. Matthew 5, 27 to 28. Read it for me, Pastor Lee. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. adultery. Exodus 20, uh, reference of Exodus 20, verse 14, and Deuteronomy 5, 18. But I say to you that everyone who so much as looks at a woman with evil desire, for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus explained it. Adultery is from the heart. It starts from the heart. When your heart is full of evil desires towards somebody who is not your wife or towards somebody who is not your husband or towards somebody who is not uh, legally married to you. Once you start imagining and all of that, you sin in your heart. Jesus explained it. In fact, Jesus said, you don't even need to go and sleep with a woman. Once you conceive those thoughts, you have sinned. He, mm -hmm. he raised the bar. He raised the standard. Because the Pharisees thought they were doing a good job. Jesus told them, you, you really can never be that righteous. And he showed them their weaknesses. Now, all of this is for Jesus to show you that you cannot save yourself. You have to rely on him to save you. Okay, are uh, the titles reverend, uh, reverend bishops, are uh, the titles biblical, and what qualifies them? Nothing wrong with titles. Just like, you know, there's nothing wrong with titles as long as that denomination agrees that they want to have titles. There's nothing wrong with it. But title is not ministry. Title is not the work. And titles are not the call of God. So after you have a title you still need to look for a calling it's not enough to have a title you know anybody can carry a title but that doesn't define your calling so instead of being defined by a title be defined by the work do the work and let the work define who you are now no 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 a question on marriage a question on marriage are uh, marriage vows biblical and while you answer that, uh, you answer together with this, that our traditional marriages or stroke come with stay marriages, biblical, and should one seek for a religious leader to bless them, just in case? Traditional marriages, they are biblical because marriage is cultural. Real marriage is traditional marriage. Real marriage, not like church marriage. Real marriage is traditional marriage. There's nothing like church marriage. It's not in the Bible. Real marriage is traditional because 
you have to see the parents of the lady and based on their culture they will ask you for what they need from you before they give their daughter to you in marriage and in some culture it is the wife it is the man that is giving to the woman in marriage so it depends on the culture and you cannot say that a marriage is not a marriage because it was not done in church and you cannot say marriage is not a marriage because it was done in a shrine marriage is marriage wherever it was done so it's culture mm -hmm. however you, you can call the pastor of your church after the traditional marriage to bless the couple but anytime you now go beyond the traditional marriage to go and do white wedding white wedding is the white man's traditional marriage so if you do white wedding you just did two traditional marriages you did your culture marriage and you did the white man's traditional marriage so you did two traditional marriages white wedding is not church wedding white wedding is white man's traditional marriage okay, okay. <laughs> what do you have to say about family altars spiritual altars as far as the baby is concerned altar means place of animal sacrifice so are you an animal? If you are not, not an animal, please don't go to the altar. But if you are an animal, by all means, go to the altar. Altar is where animals are, are butchered for sacrifice. So does that rule out the sacrifices? That, um, Jesus has finished all the sacrifices. There's no more sacrifice. Jesus is the end of sacrifices. So we don't sacrifice ourselves anymore on the altar. What do we do now? We present our bodies in acknowledgement that we are the sacrifice of Jesus for his body. The same we are sacrificed for us, we are also sacrificing for other people. Okay. What is Sabbath? And does it have, to do, have anything to do with the day? What is Sabbath? So let's begin from where it appeared for the first time in the Bible. Pastor Liz, you read for me. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. God ended the work which he had done, yeah. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So the, the Sabbath is God's rest from work. Sabbath means God's rest from work. It's not a day. So what mm -hmm. Christ did, what Christ has done is God's Sabbath and God is resting in the finished work of Christ that's why in the book of Matthew they challenge Jesus for healing on the Sabbath day and Jesus said man is not made for the Sabbath the Sabbath is made for man and I am the Lord of the Sabbath so the moment you receive Jesus you are an, in an eternal Sabbath Sabbath is no more a Saturday Sabbath now is a person. His name is Jesus. Come unto me, only that labor and a heavy loading, I will give you rest. So Jesus is the Sabbath of God. Once you receive Jesus, you are in Sabbath all the days of your life. Amen. Amen. Soul ties, do they exist? Do you have soul ties? The Bible doesn't teach that. I don't know where they got it from. I don't know what, what they used to tie the soul. Is it a rope or a, a chain or a wire or something? I don't know. It's, it's not in the Bible. Spiritual husbands? Spiritual husbands? It's not in the Bible. There's nothing like spiritual husband. There's nothing like spiritual wife. Spirits don't marry. They are like the angels. So there's no marriage in the spirit. So there's nothing like spiritual wife. Jesus said spirits don't marry. Because they asked Jesus about, mar spirit, about marriage. A particular family where their daughter married the, somebody's son and the son died. Married the second son, 
the second son died. Mary, the third son, the third son died. To the seventh son. Then they now ask Jesus, on the day of resurrection, whose wife will she be? Because all the sons had her. And Jesus said to them, are you without understanding? In the spirit, there is no husband. Spirits don't marry. They are like the angels. There's not like, like spiritual husband. There's not like spiritual wife. There is only spiritual ignorance and Africanization of, of the concept. Otherwise, whom the son says free is free indeed. Some say, but I'm having sex in the dream. It's not because you have spiritual wife or husband. You're having sex in the dream. It's all inside your head. The whole sex is happening inside your head. There's no spirit inside. It's in your head. And also, some people, it's just biological. Okay, some people, biological, so they have wet dreams. But some people, it's not biological. It's because of sexual activity going on in the head. Meditation, movies, um, nude movies, pornography, and all of that has created such chemical reactions in their mind that they sleep and in their dreams they are having sex. That's not a spiritual husband at all in any way. And how do you overcome those? You renew your mind. You don't need deliverance. Don't let anybody cash out on, on your ignorance. You don't need deliverance. You just need the renewing of your mind. If you spend time in the word of God and meditate the word of God, the word of God will wash those images from your mind and free you from those images. It is called the washing of water by the word. Okay. Monitoring spirits. I don't know about it. I've not seen <laughs> it in the Bible. Monitoring spirits are these uh, cockroaches, the lizards, the, <laughs> the bees. <laughs> Which book did they write it? Where did they get it from? Pastor Lee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought money stream spirits are spirits that monitor people to know where they are always. <laughs> Don't mind me, it's uh, not in the Bible. There's nothing like generation, that. <laughs> generation of curses, chains, and bondages in the families. Jesus has set you free from all those. Jesus has freed the believer from all such. The believer is free indeed. Uh -huh. The devil is stripped all his power, right? Well, okay, can a believer be tortured by the powers of darkness? A believer in ignorance can be tortured. It's called oppression. He can be oppressed, he can be suppressed, but he cannot be possessed. Mm -hmm. Oppressed using what power and the devil is stripped of his power? Sorry? Oppressed using what power and the devil has got no power? It, the devil uses the believer's power to oppress him. When you are ignorant, Satan will come and use your own power to oppress you. Mm -hmm. Should we have time or rather should we set aside time in our church services to cast out the, uh, demons. No, no, we came to church to study the word of God, not to cast out demons. So a pastor that is busy casting out demons in a church service does not understand his assignment. He gave the gifts for the perfecting of the saints to do the work of ministry, not for casting out demons from the saints. It is the saints, the believers, that should be the ones casting out demons from unbelievers. This sign shall follow those that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. He didn't say believers will have demons cast out of them. When we come together to fellowship, we come to, to learn the word of God and grow so we can go and save the world and free the world from the bondage of, of darkness. So a pastor that understands his job will not waste people's precious time trying to do the so-called deliverance, which is actually an entertainment service in futility sometimes. Amen. What is religion? Religion is a make belief. Man's effort to trying to find God. And man cannot find God. You can't find God. You can only have the revelation of God in the person of Christ. So God can only be revealed within the revelation of himself. 
but religion is man's efforts and standards to qualify for God, which is not possible. What is the difference between deliverance and casting out demons? Deliverance is salvation, a movement from one kingdom to another. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, verse 13, who have delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So deliverance is a movement from darkness to light. What is casting out demons? The word cast out demons means to expel demons, to expel demons. And it is believers that expel demons from unbelievers. Believers expel demons from unbelievers. That's the difference. In casting out demons, we can cast out the demon from somebody that is not born again. But in deliverance, once you are delivered, you are born again. No demon can stay around where you are because there's a new occupant occupying you. His name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. mm. What is revival? What is what? Revival. Revival. Revival means to bring back to life that which is dead. <laughs> okay. It's not a service. <laughs> no, it's not a service. It's to, so, to bring back those that are dead. And believers are not supposed to be dead. So you can't be doing revival service for believers. But if there's going to be any revival, it should be a revival of knowledge. Bringing believers to a place of knowledge where they know what Christ has done for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament prophets or prophecy or the content, content of the prophets? It's a full teaching, but I have a book on it. Um, Gift and Callings of God. It's on Amazon. It will help a lot, but it's a full teaching. So the difference between Old Testament prophet and New Testament prophet is simple. In the Old Testament, because people are not born again, the Spirit of God didn't live in them. Prophets were called seers. They saw things and told people. But Joel retired prophets from being seers. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. So when the Spirit of God was poured out on every one of us, prophets don't see visions for us anymore. Prophets don't give us like package prophecies because all of us hear from God. My sheep hear my voice, except you're not born again. So since we hear from God directly, we don't need a prophet to be telling us what God is saying because we are mm -hmm. in talking terms with God. So what's the job of a New Testament prophet? To teach the word of God and mature believers to serve the purpose of God. That's all. Okay. What is the renewal of mind? You have mentioned about the renewal of mind. What is the renewal? The renewing of the mind is to allow the word of God align your thoughts to think in line with the word of God simply. Align your thoughts? Your thoughts, yeah. To fall in line with the thoughts of God as revealed in his word. Okay. Some of us know that there is numbers which we, that there are numbers which are very symbolic with what is in God. Like we say, number seven is for perfection. Number five is for I, grace. Number I don't know where they got that. It's not in the Bible. It's rubbish. It's total rubbish. All those numbers are rubbish. They are not in the Bible. For example, they say five is the number of grace. That's the that's the biggest that's the biggest ignorance I've ever had. Because if you say five is the number of grace, then it means five has to be the number of grace in Hebrew and Greek. But the word grace in Hebrew is the word chesed. Chesed. C-H-E-S-E-D. Six numbers. C-H-E-S-E-D. Six. Or chenan. Chenan. C-H-E-N-A-N. Six numbers or chen C H E N four numbers. None of them is five. In the Greek, <laughs> it is the word charisma. Charisma C H 
A R I S M E about eight numbers or caris C H A R I S six. So it's either caris or charisma or charismata C H A R I S M A T A. None of it is five. Whether in the Greek or Hebrew, so grace cannot be the number five. It's fraud. Because if five is the number of grace, it should be five in every language. So all those things on numbers is fraud. Don't let anybody take advantage of you. And I'm talking to the people who have always believed in numbers. Get rid of it. Stay with the teaching of God's word. Uh, should you advise us uh, to uh, go to the original and learn more from uh, the original? Uh, Beyond the English version. No, you. I will not advise everybody to go and be looking for the original because they cannot even understand it. So it mm -hmm. is the pastor of the church that should now start learning to use the Greek and the Hebrew to train the people in his congregation. And that takes a lot of time. Okay. What is the blood of Jesus? The blood of Jesus is the life of Jesus. The blood of mm -hmm. Jesus is the life of Jesus. It's not liquid. Because the book of Exodus says, the life of everything is in the blood. So when we say blood, we mean life. So when we say the blood of Jesus, you're saying the life of Jesus. So, um, so uh, the blood is not meant to be splashed. No. On cars, on roads, on, on houses, or imaginary. Where, where is splashing it from? Where is this stored? Is this stored in a drum? Or is this stored in a bucket or in a container somewhere? And if it is stored, doesn't it finish? Because if it's liquid, it's matter. It means it finishes. The blood of Jesus is not liquid or matter. The blood of <laughs> Jesus is the work of Christ. So you don't sprinkle it. You don't sprinkle the blood. Moreover, you're not the high, high priest. It is the high priest that sprinkles the blood in the in the in the mercy seat. Only the high and Jesus is our high priest, and he has already sprinkled the blood. So what do we do? We use his name. He has given us his name. So instead of saying the blood of Jesus, we say in Jesus' name. We have always covered our children with the blood of Jesus and everything that concerns us. Please stop covering them allow them to be seen so that they can find favor <laughs> open them up don't cover them <laughs> christ is in he is in, in not covering they already they are already covered by the presence of christ in <laughs> uh, what are the functions of the blood of jesus that's his work what he did the blood of Jesus is his work, what he has done. So what is the function of what Jesus has done? It frees man from sin. Mm -hmm. It delivers man from bondage. It gives man a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Is there hell? Is hell real? Yes, there is a hell. The Bible teaches hell. But there, mm -hmm. there are four different words for hell. And I don't have the time to go into them now. But yes, there is a hell. Mm -hmm. How many heavens do we have? One. So, no that heaven. Sorry? No third heaven. No third heaven. Third mm -hmm. heaven was a Jewish idiom. It was a figure of speech. And it was Paul who used it when he said he was caught to the third heaven. It was a Jewish idiom. And there's no other corroboration to that. Moreover, he was caught into the third heaven was a vision. And sometimes in the language of vision, if you are not careful, you can get confused. There's nothing like third heaven. There's only one heaven, and that heaven is in Christ. Now, that brings me to a statement that you made the other day. I don't know whether it's the other day. You said that uh, Jesus is not <laughs> Jesus is not the Lion of Judah. 
I followed through, you explained, but a lot of the preachers and your followers, they have a pro problem with that. They have a problem because they do not believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And if he's the Lamb, he can't be a lion. The moment you start thinking that Jesus is a lamb and a lion, you're giving God a dual character. That means he's the God who killeth and maketh alive. That means it is God that destroys. That means it is God that kills. That means it is God that is responsible for evil and responsible for good. God cannot have a dual character. God's character is one. God is light. There's no darkness. He came to give life and no death. God doesn't kill. Death is the enemy of God. Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death which is Satan. So God cannot have dual character. He cannot be a lion and at the same time a lamb. We know that in the entire scriptures, he is portrayed as the lamb of God. That word lion was used by a Jew in the book of Revelation in John's vision. You can't build a doctrine out of a vision. You build a doctrine out of the scriptures. Jesus is not a lion. Jesus is a lamb. That is why the gospel is counterculture. And that is why Jewish people cannot are struggling to believe the gospel. How can Jesus come and say the Savior who came to save and he died? It doesn't make sense. Jewish people expect that if Jesus is the Savior, he should come and destroy and take over by force. That's the way kings operate. And since he's the king of kings, he should oppress and be wicked to men. But instead he comes as a lamb, he is killed. And he reigns in his death. He reigns in his humility. And Jesus reigns by service. In order for him to reign over us, he first of all serves us his life. That's a lamb. That's not a lion. So the entire body of truth in scripture establishes that Jesus is a lamb and not a lion. However, you know, anybody that is struggling with that, we need a lot of teaching to finally come into terms with the fact that God has only a singular character and that God is good and nothing more. Okay, why is the book of Revelation hard to understand? Why is it hard to understand? Because, because it came out of a vision. The book of Revelation came from a vision and in the vision there are heavy metaphors. And the only way you can understand the book is by understanding the epistles. Because the epistles demystify the metaphors. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the flesh? The flesh. Is a, is, it depends. There's no general word for the flesh. Mm -hmm. So it depends on, on from which scripture. Okay, what is the flesh? And since it ranges against the spirit, how can one overcome it? The flesh is the nature of a man. In that context, the flesh is the nature of a man without Christ. And that is why it will go against the spirit of God. What about the flesh in the, in the believer? Well, flesh in the believer is a way of thinking that goes against the word of God, which he needs to renew. That's why it's called the spirit of your mind, to be carnally minded, carnally minded. So mm -hmm. it's a mindset, a way of thinking that contradicts the word of God, which a believer needs to align with the word of God. Thank you. Uh -huh. Jesus told Simon Peter that your name i call you the rock and upon this rock i'm going to build my church now should that rock that is born of the revelation of who god is or who christ is should be should that be the foundation of the church today and what is the church well the word church is the word ecclesia in the greek it means an assemblage a gathering that's the meaning of church a gathering mm -hmm. all right that's the meaning mm -hmm. of church that's why there's nothing like online church because the word church means physical <laughs> gathering so when you say online church you are having english problem you know like 
like you used to say, English is English in them. That's what's happening to them. To say online church, your English is English in you because online cannot be church. Church has to be physical. Where I touch you, you touch me. I pray for you, you pray for me. That's, that's church, a, a physical gathering, an assemblage. But people online are not in church, even though they think they're in church. You can start online, but you don't stay online. After a while, you need to find a physical gathering where you pray for people, people pray for you, where you bless people, people bless you, where you reach physical people and preach the gospel to them and take care of their concerns and bring them to spiritual growth. So when he says, on this rock, I will build my church, the rock was not Peter. The rock was revelation knowledge. That means the church of Jesus is built on the revelation knowledge. Revelation mm -hmm. knowledge. So when people come into a place of revelation knowledge, they form the fulcrum, the strength of the church. That's where Jesus' church begins from, revelation knowledge. Okay, Papa. Um, checking on our time, and it uh, seems we are running out of time because I know you're, you have a class in a few minutes. And I have a lot of, I have two pages untouched. Pastor Liz, we can do it again. If, yes, we will. If you still have a lot of questions, we can create another one. We will. Yeah. I, yeah, we don't have much time. We have a few minutes. And uh, I'm, I'm not ending it here because there is a lot. Uh, this time round, we had a lot of them bring questions on board and uh, we thank God for the turnout seems people are hungry to learn and also to be equipped for the work of the ministry so I'm mine I just want to give you this chance first of all to tell you thank you so much for actually uh, making yourself available for this show and for myself and for everybody else here we really learn from you and uh, we take you as a gift and there are people who call you a blessing and a gift. And we're Thank really you, Pastor Liz, and thank you for also having me here. Thank you for giving the people an opportunity to have clarity. You know, I believe that some of the things we have answered will help some people. There are some people that will still struggle with a number of things because of their mindset. Mm -hmm. But if they can just calm down, calm down, calm down. And then look at the Bible again carefully. Those things will come right for them. And you can never find the truth in a lie. So it's important to calm down and come by the knowledge of the truth. And you can only find the knowledge of the truth when the scriptures are rightly divided in the light of Christ. So thank you, Pastor Liz, for having me. And everybody who spared the time to be with us and learn and grow, we appreciate all of you. We honor every one of you for giving us your time. And make sure that the next time Pastor Liz informs you that she's going to have another session with me, come with everybody, including those who don't like me. Tell them to come. Just They should just come. We like to have them around us while we're teaching. But adventure, one of the revelations, we enter them like that, and they will wake up to know what the truth is. But I'm really glad to be here. You know, and uh, thank you, Pastor Liz. Thank you so much. This, this one Muslim that is watching, and uh, he wanted you to just talk about his faith uh, of rejecting Christ. Just that, the last one. The last to talk one about his faith? Faith, 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 faith uh, uh, after rejecting Christ. What happens to him? He's a Muslim. Yes. He wants to know if he rejects Christ, what will happen to him? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He that believeth not in Christ is condemned already. Is condemned. But he that believes is not condemned. So if you do not accept Christ, if you reject Christ, you're already condemned. You've kept yourself away from the mercy, the grace, and the love of God. And God cannot force himself on you. God does nothing by force. God loves you. He wants you. He's willing to reveal himself to you. And he's willing to relate 
connect with you and just love you the way you are. You don't have to be good to come to him, just the way you are. And today, if you just ask him, he's willing to come in and make a difference in your life. Thank you so much. And actually, they have admitted that there are many Muslims watching, and we bless the Lord for that. And uh, so I would like to give you this chance to pray with us or to pray for us. Let's pray together, everybody. Father, we pray for everybody on the platform tonight. Revelation knowledge grows big in your heart until nothing else matters. Barriers are broken. Sick bodies are healed. Those of you in need of salvation, I decree that the revelation of God's word fills your heart and mind and that your heart comes to a place of persuasion and a place of an encounter with Jesus Christ. I break the holes of darkness. I decree that the light shines. Clarity comes to the minds of your people. And above all, everyone under the sound of my voice, you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I call you fruitful unto every good work. Great grace abound towards you. It is well with you today. And the blessing is upon all of you that are in this broadcast. And I pray that everyone connected to this broadcast will come to the place of accurate understanding of God's plan, God's will, and God's purpose for your life. I pray for TMM. I pray for Pastor Lise. She continues to make impact. She continues to advance the cause of Christ. She continues to advance the purpose of God. Pastor Lisa, I speak over you. You are delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. No weapon formed against you prospers. The grace of God continues to multiply through you and many come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Great grace is upon everyone here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. Praise amen. God. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so you Pastor Lisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Papa. We bless the Lord for you. Man. I'm trying to sign out. <laughs> Let me do it from this end. Oh. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Glory to God. We praise the Lord and we bless the Lord. And because time is not on our side, including myself because there it's only 11 minutes to time to the discipleship class that usually start at exactly midnight 12 from kenya and in nigeria i think is from 10 p.m so that is why we had to cut short the life and we have a lot of financial questions but mine is just to tell you, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your craving for the knowledge of Christ. And uh, your craving to grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I just also want to take this time to say that you are blessed. You are filled up with God. You are standing in the abundance of God and all that is in God is in you, and all that is not in God should not be in you. And we claim it, we do it, we speak it, we see it, and we live it. So for all of you from wherever you have watched us from, we just want to appreciate your time, your comments, your questions. Everything, everything that you've given to this show, and uh, we will communicate about the next live that we're going to do right here on TMM and we really appreciate you so thank you so so much as I actually give you this song uh, uh, huh. you can live at your own time you are blessed <laughs> Sorry for those who do not understand this language. I'll sing it after in English. That man says that you God who lives Abu and Abu. Abu and Abu is what in English? You God that lives everlasting to everlasting. <laughs>
That song in English. The boss and I know the song was being sung. It is impossible. I'm, I'm unable. So you people, thank you so much. You're blessed. You're blessed. You are seated in the abundance of God. You are seated in His completeness and His goodness. You are enough. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll do some English songs. Actually, by the end of this year, I must do some English songs. We must go international. 
we are going international mm. you people of musava musava is another village just behind here narobi and there is a village called musava so you i'm preparing you musavians that you're going to struggle and people from muranga muranga is another county that they speak they don't know how to rare and lale lilolu so i'm going to do some english songs you better actually now learn english and uh, catch up with my english <laughs> english songs so thank you so much for you are amazing you are family a divine family and you increase and i pray for the increase of the knowledge of christ in you and of our sin god grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ in jesus name amen amen goodbye keep it jesus <laughs>